glass ceilings have two things going for them. They're see-through, and they were meant to be broken. Since the beginning of the U.S. Air Force's history, women have set their sights beyond barriers and shattered any that got in their way. In 1943, women were called to serve out of necessity. With men increasingly heading to combat during World War II, their stateside roles were left open. What started out as an experiment evolved into a path that would change history. Women were vital to the war effort. They served as radio operators, maintenance specialists, and test pilots. Some even flew overseas to evacuate wounded troops from the sands of North Africa and the beaches of Normandy. They proved they were capable of more than tradition assumed. Little did they know that their curiosity and courage to do something different would set the foundation for future generations of women to rise above barriers. The first woman to earn two stars was an airman. The first female fighter pilot was an airman. The first military women to walk among the stars and command space shuttles were airmen. And the first woman to serve as the senior enlisted leader for any military branch is an airman. The Air Force has the most female members of all the military branches and has historically led the way in expanding opportunities for them to serve. But it's not just the number of women who serve. It's what each and every one brings to our force. Women's achievements in the Air Force and now the U.S. Space Force are endless. As both branches continue to evolve, what defines success has to. Reaching new heights is less about being the first and more about being empowered to be who you are and achieve what you want to achieve. Women have helped change and continue to advance standards from fighting for all dependents to receive equal benefits, to earning the right to serve in combat, and for some, making the ultimate sacrifice. Standard issue no longer fits what we're capable of. It never did. As we set our sights higher, new leaders can step forward. They already have and will continue to make room for more. It's fitting that the two most forward-thinking branches serve two domains that have represented hope and possibility for centuries. The sky and the stars. The Air Force and the Space Force were established by looking up and daring to see more. So where will you set your sights? You never know how far you will go and who you might inspire along the way. gentlemen. My name is Master Sergeant Veronica Garrison, and I'm honored to serve you as your MC and moderator for today's forum. Please join me in welcoming our panel members and Commander Air Mobility Command, General Mike Minahan, who will provide today's opening comments. thoughts. That video really was powerful. I think we owe a round of applause for whoever made that. It's awesome. Uh, our Constitution and our oath provides us all the guidance we need for diversity. And there's one person on this stage, not me, that kind of, in my mind, summed it up appropriately with the following statement. Lethality fueled by thriving talent with uncompromisingly high standards enforced by peers. 
lethality fueled by thriving talent with uncompromisingly high standards enforced by peers. It acknowledges that lethality matters most. It acknowledges that the magic is the talent. It acknowledges that the talent has incredibly high standards and is thriving, that every barrier to thrive has been eliminated and lowered and removed. And that our peers have no lens to the standards that goes through a gender, a background, or any other way. And that everybody can thrive in that environment. So, Reba, thank you for queuing me up on that one. I'll simply repeat. I've had the good fortune to serve with these wonderful airmen on this stage in, in a, for an enormous amount of years. And you all, every one of you, is, uh, has played a role in the opportunity that lies before me. And I could not be more grateful. We'll end with this. My aide said it best. She said, this seminar should have been called Legends. So to the legends, a round of applause to welcome you. General Menahan, please allow me to start by introducing our distinguished panelists. Full bios may be found under the ATA app for the seminar. Major General Laura Lenderman is Director of Operations, Headquarters, United States Transportation Command, Scott Air Force Base, Illinois. She is responsible for directing and providing associated policy guidance for the all-domain deployment of forces and the distribution of supplies and equipment for wartime, peacetime, and humanitarian operations for the Department of Defense, including joint training, exercises, and war planning. Brigadier General Rebecca Sankas is the commander, my commander, of the 618th Air Operations Center, Scott Air Force Base, Illinois, responsible for operational planning, scheduling, directing, and assessing a fleet of approximately 1,100 aircraft in support of combat delivery and strategic airlift, air refueling, global air mobility support, and aeromedical operations around the world. <laughs> Colonel Angela Ochoa is the commander. She is the commander of the 19th Airlift Wing, Little Rock Air Force Base, Arkansas. The wing provides combat-ready forces to meet combatant commanders' requirements globally. She ensures support for combat contingency and humanitarian requirements around the world while providing for the health and welfare of more than 10,000 personnel and families at Little Rock Air Force Base. <laughs> Chief Master Sergeant Rebecca Bateman is the command chief for the 628th <laughs> Air Base Wing, Joint Base Charleston, South Carolina. She guides base operating support covering six different focus areas and enables installation support. She is responsible for delivering assistance measures to 67 Department of Defense and other federal agencies, providing installation support to a total force of over 90,000 airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, civilians, dependents, and retirees. Finally, Chief Bateman leads across several installations, including Charleston Air Force 
Charleston Air Base, which hosts the 437th Airlift Wing and the 315th Airlift Wing, the Naval Weapons Station Charleston, and the North Auxiliary Airfield. <laughs> Ms. Anna Card is the Chief Resources and Capability Integration Division, Headquarters Air Mobility Command, Scott Air Force Base, Illinois. In this capacity, she directs the staff of over 15 military, civilian, and contract personnel, enabling AMC's master operations vision through establishment of policies, procedures, capability-based planning, and resources. The division executes and manages an annual headquarters AMC A310 budget of $90 million. She manages and prioritizes $98 billion in operational capabilities for weapon systems across 14 programs. Ms. Card ensures over $60 million per year is executed in support of aircrew training and mission planning systems, directly supporting the defense transportation system and force projection capabilities. <laughs> And last but not least, Major Kirby Rudon is the Director of Operations, 14th Airlift Squadron, Joint Base Charleston, South Carolina. She is responsible for organizing, training, and equipping over 175 C-17A aircrew and support personnel who deploy worldwide in support of contingency operations that involve the airland and airdrop delivery of forces, equipment, and supplies. So a list of questions has been compiled for our panelists. We'll direct each question to a specific panelist for an initial response, with others con contributing to the dialogue as they desire. If we have time for additional questions, we will poll the audience members at the end. So to get started, we would like all the panelists to respond to our opening question, with Major General Lenderman leading us. So ma'am, what has led you to a career of service and leadership through the Department of Defense, and what continues to motivate you in your current leadership position? Thank you so much for the question, and I want first to kind of start off with a couple of thank yous. So thank you to you, Lieutenant Colonel Bassett, wherever she is, who put this panel together, and especially to General Minahan and Ashley, Chief VK and Kareen. You guys lead, you all lead with conviction and courage, and we're so grateful for your leadership and support, especially for this panel, and for all the men and women in this room here today. So thank you so much. I also want to thank ATA and our leadership there, um, General McNabb, Chief Williams. Uh, thank you for bringing us all together and showing us what right looks like. This is one of the best ATAs that we've been to, and I'll do their leadership throughout the year. So uh, with that, I'll kind of turn to the question, which is probably most important. Uh, <laughs> So I really love this question. This is one of the questions that I ask airmen all the time. Um, it's a great opener. It's a great way to understand their stories, to get to know them a little bit better on a personal level. And uh, for me, um, I just I think it's, it's important that we understand who we are and where we came from and what makes us ourselves. Um, so we all join for a lot of different reasons. And a lot of airmen join for education, for opportunity, and because they have a deep love of our country and they just want to serve. And uh, those are all incredible reasons, and I'll talk about why we stay, because I think it's more, a little more common uh, reason why we all stay. Uh, but for me, um, you know, back, way back time machine, it's around 1980, um, if you can picture it, big hair, Jordache jeans, those uh, members only jackets that we all used to wear, MTV, you guys don't know what I'm talking about in this room, but we looked really good, by the way. <laughs> So my sister and I, we grew up in an Air Force family, and we lived at Scott Air Force Base, the home of Air Mobility Command. And I live about, yeah, I live about 50 yards from the house that I grew up in, and I can sit in my backyard and look at the steps and see that little girl sitting on the steps with our friends. And maybe we snuck out once or twice, maybe not, 
not, not to say here, but, um, but we did, we had a wonderful childhood growing up. It was kind of an idyll, idyllic childhood. Um, you trusted your neighbors. Uh, you were all part of this community that, that loved our country. We were patriots. Uh, there were great opportunities on base. And my sister and I were, were really into sports. And so we loved playing just about every single sport back then. And, uh, and I loved being a part of a winning team. And uh, General Minahan and Chief BK, you talk about winning teams. And that was my first experience to, to be on a team. And I realized I love this. I love being a part of something bigger than myself, something that's getting after a goal that's much more important than what individuals can accomplish on their own. And so it was kind of in that moment, as a little 10-year-old up in my bedroom, I was listening to the C9s take off there at Scott, and I thought, I want this. I want this for myself. I want this for my family. And uh, I kind of set my mind to it. And luckily, I had two great mentors with my dad. He was uh, in the service, as I mentioned. He was a mobility pilot, Vietnam veteran. My mom was a middle, middle school teacher and a, a great volunteer in the community. And, and luckily, I had their support. Because I did not know that in 1980, that was the first year that women could graduate from the academy. I did not know that three years prior, that was the first year that women graduated from UPT. Those barriers, I had no idea that they were up for women at the time. I thought everything was available, and luckily I had parents who believed in that too. So thank, thank you to all the women out there and the ones that came before us that opened and broke down those barriers, and especially for the leadership that believed in them, because it really does take all of us. It's not just the individuals, but it's the people that can change policy, that can change attitudes, that can change culture. And uh, that's what happened. You know, 1980s onward, we've seen incredible changes for women, all women and men. Uh, but for me particularly, when I was in college, that was when the first woman could fly a fighter aircraft. So Jeannie Levitt, now a dear friend, uh, kind of a trailblazer there. We saw our first secretary, female secretary of the Air Force. We've seen many since then. We saw our first female Thunderbird, special operations. Just about every career field is open to us today. And we also have seen our first female four stars and several others since then. And now our first female combatant commanders. Um, just extremely grateful for just living in the time that I live in and especially for the men and women that came before us that have changed, really changed my life. Um, and that's really to get to why I stay. You know, I want to be a part of that change. I want to help you in the audience. I want to help you out there uh, that in the field uh, continue to break down barriers. There's still some work to be done. Um, there's some things we need to work on when it comes to our uniforms, when in pregnancies, families, uh, just opportunities in general, spouse support, all those things that make it a family, make it a community that people want to join and most importantly want to stay. So that's why I stay. I want to inspire, hopefully, uh, at least provide some, some help where I can, but especially, you know, the young ones out there, both the, the men and the women. You know, I just met uh, uh, Yusafa Academy cadet. Uh, Madeline Dibble, and she's hopefully going to be a C-17 pilot someday, and uh, maybe she'll be up on this panel, and she'll be talking about all the things that we were able to do together to help her become the best person that she could be. So with that, I'll turn it over to Reva. All right, uh, General Minahan, thank you for hosting this, and thank you for your support on this topic in particular. Um, I do actually, for the men in the audience, raise your hands. It's really hard to see up here. Raise your hand if you're a man in the audience. Thank you for being here, man. I mean, we, we go through this topic all the time, and I say we're talking to ourselves. But, you know, I mean it when it's our peers that, that need to be the ones that are the change agents to eliminate barriers so that we have the right talent in the room. So thank you for being here. That means the world to me to see that there's actually more men than women in the audience today. That is awesome, and I appreciate that support. Uh, so back to the, the topic at hand. Um, you know, third grade, my great aunt and uncle took me to the Michigan State Fair. And uh, there was a recruiting booth there and a picture of the Thunderbirds, and I was like, I'm going to be a fighter pilot. Can I fly that aircraft? And the recruiter said, yes. Well, I didn't know that it was a trainer aircraft, that they were the T-38, that in that time you were going to go through T-38s and pilot training. So sure, I was going to get to fly that. I didn't know that women couldn't fly fighter aircraft. In my little third grade brain, I was going to be a fighter pilot. And, and thus begins my journey. And I started pestering um, the Air Force Academy in middle school about going there. Um, and that's when I actually started to learn a little bit more about what we couldn't do. Um, what I am very grateful for is I grew up in a family with two older brothers and parents that didn't see barriers. They were like, if you want to go do that, go do it and make them tell you no. 
Uh, we didn't have an extraordinary amount of money, so I knew I was going to have to find a path to college, but I knew I wanted to fly, so that path was pretty easy. And if you'll notice when I have this discussion, it's a very me-centric path of what I want to do, which we'll get to the why I stay in a minute here. But I end up having that glorious journey of going to the Air Force Academy, of making it through at a time when we cut pilot training slots to be able to go to pilot training, of finally getting to my first weapon system, of deploying, and if you guys remember the Balkans operations and all of that, we deployed continuously supporting all the Balkans operations in Kosovo. And I'm on my journey. I'm going to actually have an essay from my third grade teacher that I was going to pilot the space shuttle and be an astronaut. And I'm on my journey. I got my engineering degree. I'm flying. I'm getting ready to apply for test pilot school. And then I got non-volunteered to fly the Predator unmanned aircraft. And I became a disaster of an officer and not the best human being because it was the transition for me and everything I wanted to what my country needed me to do. And I couldn't process that. It took me a bit. It took a lot of mentors along the way. And there I was flying an unmanned aircraft on 9-11. I was deployed then. And that's when I found out why we serve. To support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I tell you, that was a life-changing moment. And that is why I continue to serve. This team around us that is able to do the impossible, to take what resources are in front of them and get after it, and get after fighting the enemy. And that's the teammates that I'm surrounded by now. So it's a, a journey from third grade all the way to now. I am a complete failure in life because I never became an astronaut and I clearly have not landed on Mars, but I will take my journey every day. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, sir, for having us here. And I'm just so honored to be um, up on stage with all of you um, today. So um, to get to quickly to the questions, um, so I wish I could say that it, I joined and I was led because of service. Um, but really, I was the oldest of four kids, and I, needed an and I wanted and needed an education. So for me, it was about getting to school and uh, getting on my path in life because I knew that I had to pay my way and I had to earn that and, uh, and there was a very clear path for me through military service. There's a lot more to that but, uh, but that's the bottom line was I, I, I wanted to do something that would help me get my education. And interestingly enough, that, that is clearly not why I stay. Um, in fact, uh, there's a lot of reasons, and I want to touch on three different topics for why I stay now and why I continue to serve, and they're very personal reasons for me. Um, number one is that I have two little girls. Um, they're amazing. Their names are Elsa and Sienna. I always try to mention them so I can say I talked about them on stage to all you people. Um, but uh, they are amazing, and they are our future. I also have 11 nieces and nephews, and I want them to have the life that I've had. I want them to have the freedoms that that we can enjoy today. So at the end of the day, it, it really truly is about setting it up for them so that they have the future that we have right now and securing that future and our nation's defense and all of the things that we take for granted. Another reason why I continue to serve is because quite a few years ago, uh, my family went through one of the most difficult times in our lives. And we don't have time for that whole story today, but it was my Air Force family. And many of you, are in this room today, and you know who you are, but it was my Air Force family that picked us up, dusted us off, and got us back up on our feet again, and if it weren't for you all, if it weren't for the Air Force family that I have, I would not be here today. They were the ones that when I was in my darkest hour and my family was in our darkest hour and I didn't know how the next day was gonna go, they said, come on, we got you," And they linked arms with me and they picked me up and we kept moving forward. So ever since that day and ever since that time, I'm paying that back. And I'm paying that back by investing in our future. Because what we have, the culture we have and the family that we have, nobody else has it. It is amazing and it is special and we have to keep that going. And then lastly, the last reason is because of all of you. We have amazing airmen. They are phenomenal airmen. 
And every day that I get to go to work and I get to see our airmen out there on the line doing the business, it just inspires me. And it makes me want to be a better leader, a better commander, a better person. So at the end of the day, it's, it's every single airman that's out there because they are amazing and they are awesome. And I continue to serve because of them. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I guess my story's very different from all the other panelists just because my uniform's even different. So when I came into civil service, um, and I'm a career civil service person for 33 years, I had no really knowledge of the military. So my father was a veteran, but that was way before I was born. But I, you know, I grew up in Biloxi, Mississippi. My family was very strong and supportive of us. And uh, so I was finishing college and I said, well, you know, I need to get a job. So um, I went into the campus recruiting place and Lo and behold, they have all these little sheets, and I signed up to interview with AFPC for something called a Palace Acquire Intern Program. And um, I really did the interview for practice because I hadn't done any interviews yet, and I thought, well, I'm gonna go do this. So I went in, and um, the recruiter there, you know, he was telling me all about the Air Force and, and what the program was about, and it really piqued my interest. And two days later, I was offered a position to start at base level as an intern. So I went home and, and I accepted and I thought, wow, this is really something. So um, I got into the Air Force kind of by a fluke. It was kind of a mistake, but it was the best mistake or best fluke that ever happened to me in my life. So the first day I was there, you know, I, I um, remember driving on base and you know, I had some enlisted military in, in my, my squadron and, and they were, you know, explaining the ropes to me. And, uh, you know, and then I got to see the military in action. And I really knew within a very short period of time that this is where I wanted to be. I wanted to be part of something that was much bigger than myself and I wanted to serve my country in a capacity that was different than wearing a uniform because that's what had been given to me. So as a civil servant, I guess, you know, I, um, I looked at my role as being to provide the best support to the warfighter that I could, but I also looked at my role as to be able to support the military and industry partners to kind of be that continuity to kind of be able to understand the corporate processes and how they work, and then to look at change and to, to really give that historical perspective and to talk about how we can maybe change status quo for the better. So um, that's kind of my story of how I, I got here, but what motivates me every day to show up to work is when I sit in the operations uh, conference room and I see our missions, and I see what we do, and what we provide to the world. It's absolutely amazing. Awesome. Well, General Minahan, thank you for the opportunity to even be a part of this panel, and, and Chief Krizelnik, thank you as well. Um, so my father spent 24 years in the United States Coast Guard, and my mother was a nurse. So I figured I'll take calculus, I'll take physics too, uh, I'll take all the things I'm supposed to take, send off my application to the Coast Guard Academy and the Air Force Academy because of course they want me and they said no thank you. So um, like any child of, I was the, I'm the baby of four and there wasn't a whole lot of money for, for college. And so off I went to the Air Force recruiter with my father because uh, he pretty much was going to kill me if I joined the Army, sorry if there's any ar Army in the room, and uh, signed something called Open General. and I. He was like, with your ASVAB scores, don't you worry about it. You'll be a nurse, you'll be a you know, medic of some kind. I said, great. Um, he's a very smart recruiter. Come October, all my friends have gone off to college. I'm working at a sandwich shop, not living my best life. And uh, <laughs> he calls me and says, how's it going? And I say, man, you gotta get me out of here. And so he said, I can get you out of here in two weeks if you just change your uh, enlistment to this open general. 
I said, am I going to be security forces? He said, no way. Sure, let's go. Off to basic training, week six of basic training. Jenkins, yes sir, security forces. <laughs> Story of my life. Um, and so, my, my reasons for joining were, were college and travel. And I am very happy to say that, um, thanks to the Air Force, I have my bachelor's degree and I have traveled across the world. Um, thank you. But my, my reasons for joining are certainly not my reasons for, for staying 23 years at this point. And, um, Ma'am, like, much like you, you know, come 9-11, I'm in 81 millimeter mortar school, because you know, that's what we do in security forces, um, on the morning that the, the planes hit the towers. And my entire life changed, and my entire perspective changed on what I was doing, why I was here, and why I was serving. And um, it completely, I, I'd like to think I had a sense of patriotism before, but it certainly blossomed on 9-11. And that is what's continued to keep me going throughout my career, because, there's some pretty bad actors out there, and I have two children as well, and I'd like them to grow up in a free democracy. And uh, it, it takes heroes like all of you out there, um, and the women I'm sitting with up here to make that happen. So I would say that's why I've continued. And in my current leadership position, um, I've gotten to do a lot of cool stuff as a defender over the years, and a mission support group superintendent, and now you know a command chief. And you know, it's people like my uh, my partner in crime, Chief Master Arm Ron Howell, who. Uh, who helps me take care of the airmen and the stuff that we get to see them do across our wings um, and being at Joint Base Charleston, getting to see the sailors interact with the airmen to get that mission done. Because if you don't know, Joint Base Charleston, we have air, land, sea, and rail. That's right. So um, all those things just keep me going every day and uh, just a love for this nation. So that's why I've continued. to be on this panel with all of these legends, as was mentioned before. Um, I have to say that I, I was also motivated to, towards service because of 9-11, uh, a little bit differently um, than before. I was 10 years old and during 9-11. <laughs> we, we didn't need that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but uh, I, I do remember this distinct feeling um, of helplessness at that time because I could do little, if anything, to help when I was 10. Um, but that really drove me to want to find a path in life that allowed me to be able to act, contribute, support if our country was ever in crisis again. And so at, as I grew up, I found I wanted a, a career in aviation. And so those two um, desires combined, I found that the Air Force, through the Air Force Academy, was the right path for me. Um, why I stay in after 10 years is the mission and the people that I serve with. Um, I've had the unique opportunity to be able to see some of the real world impacts that we've been able to, to do. Um, and the, I've been able to help uh, build and teach the future aviators that will be able to go out and do the same. And um, every time I see our crews going out and executing the mission and pushing mobility every single day, it really inspires me to be my best and to help continue to fight and push and help our community go into the future. Thank you, Major. So the second question is what is something you've accomplished that you are most proud of? And I'm gonna pose that to Chief Bateman. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so there's, there's three things I'm most proud of that I've accomplished throughout my, my Air Force career. And the first is um, my marriage. Uh, I spent 19 of the 21 and a half years I've been married to my husband as a dual military couple. And we, thank you. And the, the start, so, uh, I'm really proud of us because A, so I told you I ended up security forces and then I find out my first assignment is going to be Kunsan and I'm just like, what, why? Like, what have I, what have I done <laughs> to deserve all of these things? Um, but three days into my assignment to Kunsan, I met my husband, Jason Bateman. Way cooler and sexier and hotter than the actor. <laughs> you tell him I said that, Ron. So, um, and so I met my husband three days into my assignment. He's a second term or second base airman. Uh, it's about to be senior airman, I'm an airman basic. And so we date off and on our entire year in Korea. He goes off to Nellis, his next assignment. I have orders to Germany. 
and then um, I decide I just want to go say goodbye one last time. So I go to Nellis. I haven't gone to Germany yet. And he goes to the chief and says, hey, my girlfriend's here. What happens if we get married? Chief says, marry her today. I'll get her stationed here tomorrow. I was engaged for four hours. <laughs> we got married in a Las Vegas wedding chapel. Thank you. So awesome. two defenders meet in Korea, Las Vegas wedding chapel. What can go wrong, right? So. Um, I'm very proud of us because it hasn't been easy and any dual mill couple in here, congratulations and good job because we face challenges that are just a little different than other couples and it's completely possible. So if you're doubting yourself and thinking, well, maybe I can't do this, I, I promise you, you can. All right, you can make it through deployments, you can make it through the hard times, you just have to selflessness, commitment to each other and, and belief that you can do it. So that's the first thing I'm proud of. Um, the second thing I'm proud of is making chief in the security forces career field. So I will tell you, uh, I can't see anybody really, but I'm assuming there's women in here and I'm assuming that there's pilots and maintainers and load masters and civil engineers and maybe some defenders uh, and other people who come from maybe male dominated career fields. Um, and I don't know what you put up with, but I put up with a lot of BS coming up through the years and I hope it's changed quite a bit. Um, and I used to be like, come at me, bro, like, let's do this. And I was very competitive. And then one of my previous bosses, she heard Major General Deanna Burt speak. She's in the, the Space Force. And someone asked her the question of, ma'am, how did you become a general officer in such a male-dominated career field? And she said, I just out airmen them. And I was like, Pff. like, yes, <laughs> that's all you have to do, right? So yes, I maybe have had to work harder on my PT. M maybe I've had to study more and do all these things. But I just like to look at it now as I just out airmen my fellow peers. And some of them were women putting me down too. Let's just be clear about that. Um, and so I would say, if you're in a male dominated career field or you're a minority of any kind, just be the best you. Do your job and do it really, really well. So, thank you. And uh, the, the third thing I'm most proud of is, uh, so I've been married 21 and a half years and I'm gonna try not to get emotional about this. Um, I have two kids. My, uh, I have a seven year old son and a five year old daughter. And uh, I don't know why I'm getting so emotional. My husband and I struggled for 14 years to have a baby. Zero medical explanations why. And so the first couple years, oh, you're young, don't worry about it. Oh, you're just stressing yourself out. That's cute for like a year. 14 years later, like, I need you to shut your mouth because you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, and so luckily through all my research and, and what I, you know, struggled, we did pills at Nellis, pills and shots in Guam, IUI in Italy, um, just all the struggle, and it's a really dark place to live. Uh, and if you're going through it right now, there is light at the end of the tunnel, okay? Because there are five DOD hospitals that have assisted reproductive programs. And so my husband put in to be a first sergeant, and he got orders um, to Fort Meade. And I already knew that Walter Reed Military Medical Center had an in vitro program. We got there in September. I was in the program by May. I was pregnant by June, and my son Nathan was born in February of 2015. <laughs> My daughter, Annalise, was born uh, almost two years later. And so I encourage you that you, in your darkest times, regardless of what you're going through, you have to have faith and believe and hope that there is light at the end of that tunnel. Because I promise you, it's gonna be okay. Because even if I hadn't had my babies, I could have adopted or done other things. There's always an answer, and so don't let your darkness take you down. My life has gone nothing the way I've planned it. I didn't plan to be security forces. I didn't plan to go to Korea. I met my husband. Didn't plan to be security forces. I made chief in that career field. And I never gave up hope on my children, and I have two beautiful babies. So I encourage all of you out there to just never give up on yourself. Thank you. So, Ms. Card, could you answer that question? Yeah, so, you know, there's many things that I'm very proud of in my career, but the thing that I'm most proud of is, is, is all of you. To be really honest, the pride I feel seeing what we do in um, Air Mobility Command every day just really humbles me. And um, so that, that to me, our mission and what we bring to the world is what gives me great pride and motivates me every day. The other thing I think from a personal standpoint that I'm really proud of is, um, you know, I've, I've been able to help people get through um, 
I've had enlisted folks that have worked for me that I've actually worked them through. They've went to uh, OTS and became officers. And then I've had um, civil servant people who I've actually been able to do developmental positions and really get them promoted for some really well-deserved work that they put in. And then I've also been able to work with our retired military quite a bit and be able to bring some of that back into our civilian workforce because it's definitely something that we need as we continue to move for forward. And uh, so to me, it's not necessarily, I think what I'm most proud of is seeing those people that I have been in their path along the way and watching them grow. And perhaps maybe in some small instance, I kind of contributed to that. So that's. Thank you, Ms. Carr. Okay, so our third question is what are the strengths of a good leader and what should every leader possess? And I will pose that to Major General Lenderman first. Dang it, that's a hard question. <laughs> So I think, I think if you asked 100 people, you might get 100 different answers for that one. Um, but it's a great question uh, because I think we're, always, we're all striving to be the best leader that we can be. And so what does that really mean? Um, for me, there's leaders that come in all shapes and sizes. I mean, we've seen incredible four-star generals that have, that have moved mountains. They're, they're sitting right here in the front row uh, today. We have senior enlisted leaders who move our, our mission. They, they take care of our airmen. They take care of our families. We have airmen first class. We've got airmen on their first term in the Air Force who have, who have done more than I've done in 28 years. Um, so I say that just because there's really no right answer, but I'm just going to share um, what I think uh, from my experiences, what, what means the most to me. And I think the best leaders that I've come across, the ones that have had the greatest impact on our Air Force and on me in particular, have been those that have the courage to come and bring their full self to their job. They are unabashedly themselves. And we, I love that. They are unique. Uh, they are special. Um, and each one of you has something very unique and very special about you, and that's what you bring, hopefully, to your job every day. Um, but I didn't always know that, and I didn't always feel that. Um, for many years, I kind of struggled with who I was and then who I thought I should be. And I think that's a kind of a personal thing. Um, I'm, I'm also dual military, so Chief, your story completely resonated. And I don't want to get emotional either, but, <laughs> but yeah. So I am married to an incredible airman who always knew who he was and always had this incredible confidence and could tell a story like, like you read about. And then I struggled with that. I struggled with, um, you know, what did I bring? What, did, what, was, what was unique? And, and should I be somebody else? Um, should I be somebody else besides me? And it was a couple of uh, really tough experiences and some really great mentors who taught me that, you know, you know, you gotta be you. Gotta be you. And I'll share one story, um, again, kind of a personal story, uh, but a professional story that really uh, mixed with a personal uh, tragedy that, that kind of changed me. And I was a lieutenant colonel, um, so I'd been in a couple years. I graduated squadron commander, so I felt like I kind of had at least one leadership test that I'd passed. And I was working for this really tough boss. Um, and it wasn't just your run-of-the-mill tough boss. It wasn't, uh, he, he really made things challenging for, for a lot of people around him. But I, I happened to be the person he chose to really target. And, um, and I didn't quite understand it. I, I tried as hard as I could to, to get the job done. And he seemed to appreciate the work we did, but not necessarily me as a leader. And uh, so kind of at my lowest point, I'm struggling with, with who I am and what I bring. And I'm, I'm thinking maybe this isn't the place for me anymore. And that's when my dad died. So take, take a tough job that was kind of the, the thing that I loved to do personally, and then take the most important person in my life, and you're kind of left with, what, what, what the heck? <laughs> what am I going to do? Um, who am I and what should I do? And it was really at that point when I was at my lowest of the low and most vulnerable that, um, that I really became the best leader I could be because this thought ran through my head. I thought, you know, this, this, is, this is it. The worst thing just happened. You've got nothing to lose, so just be you. And I, and I did. And from there on, it was like every door opened up. And I became a better uh, leader, became a better friend, I became a better sister, daughter, mentor, airman. 
And, uh, and that, to me, was one of the eye-opening uh, moments of my professional career, and uh, that's what I took forward into command. And so um, from there, you know, knowing that who I was, I said, you know what, when I got to be um, uh, lucky to be the wing commander at Scott Air Force Base, uh, coming back to the place that meant so much to me, um, I realized the things that are important to me and the leadership traits that, that I appreciated and hoped to emulate uh, were listening, loving, and lifting up. And I think every leader out there that, uh, that has, you know, a, a connection with their airmen is a really good listener. And uh, you listen with your eyes, you listen with your ears, you listen with your whole body as they're describing what they're doing or describing their day. You can pick up on those, those cues, and you can follow through on those cues, and you can make them a better airman just by understanding where they come from, seeking to understand what they're going through. You might not have the answers, you probably can't solve all their problems, but you can listen, and they want to be heard. Um, the other important thing about listening, though, is when not to listen. And that's those voices in your head. Those are the things that are people are telling you about yourself that you know aren't true. Um, those are the times when you need to shut down the listening and really stay true to who you are and kind of build yourself back up again or surround yourself with people that can help you do that. The second, love. I love the love. <laughs> that's, the, that's the most important thing to me as a leader. You kind of love your country. Uh, you love your airmen. You love your Air Force. You love the mission. Uh, all those things bundled up together create this incredible, uh, incredible strength within your organization. Um, people know you care. Uh, they want to be around people that, 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 that love as much as they do. But it's also about holding people to a standard. You know, all the parents out there, um, you know, my husband and I both, we struggled with the same kind of challenges, so we weren't uh, parents ourselves, but we got to be... Um, we got to be great, I'd say, pseudo-parents to some of our airmen and many of our, the people that we've worked with. But you hold them to the standard, you discipline them when, when things are not going right, and you build them back up again so they can accomplish the mission. And then lastly, you know, lifting people up. I'm a, I'm, I respond to people that are positive, that people come, walk into the room and, and they're just going to solve the problems of the day. And, and that's the thing that I lean on today is that there's really nothing that's impossible. Uh, General Minahan did an incredible job laying out a really tough problem ahead of us. Uh, but you know what? It's not impossible. Like he says, uh, they're not 10 feet tall. Uh, we are 10 feet tall. There's nothing that we can't do. And if you bring your, your, your full self, your unique strengths, you love, you listen, you lift up this organization, we can solve these tough problems together. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Colonel Ochoa, could you add to that? Sure, I will. Um, I'm going to pull out a prop. Um, both literally, literally and figuratively. So in 2020, COVID, we were stuck inside, and uh, I just found out that I was going to go into wing command, and I had a great chief that said, hey, Colonel, have you actually thought about what you're going to say about leadership when you get into wing command? I said, yeah, I need to think about that a little bit more. And, uh, and so um, during COVID, I sat down and I thought about what I think makes a good leader. And I boiled it down to six traits, and for the sake of time, I'm going to keep it short. But I put it on my personal coin, and I don't give this out very often. I only give it out when I see really good leaders. And it's on a, it's on a coin. There's six traits. It happens to be on a six-bladed prop because I'm a Herc pilot. Um, it all starts with character for me. You cannot lead if you don't have character. Bottom line. And I think we've, we all can probably agree with that when you think about what our core values are. Courage. I think General Menahan summed that up very nicely yesterday. But you cannot be a leader without courage. Love, um, you said it beautifully, ma'am, um, but you have to love your airmen because at the end of the day, it's about sacrifice and it's about serving others, and you can't do that. Love is about a choice. You can't love others um, if you don't make that choice every day. Those are things that you bring. There's also what I call gifts, and they're gifts that, you know, I'm a person that believes in a higher power. I happen to call that higher power God. I believe they are gifts from God that, that he gives me. But I also think that there are things that we can grow and we can make stronger ourselves. Strength, and I deliberately chose that word because it's physical, it's mental, it's emotional, it is spiritual, it is all the domains, um, it's grit, it's making sure that you are the best that you can be. And some days you have it and some days you don't. It also requires wisdom. Wisdom can be grown, wisdom can be learned, but it is also a gift that can be given to us. And then finally, grace. Grace to ourselves and grace to each other. And that requires a lot of compassion sometimes. So those are the six, six traits that I think and they fit nicely on a six-bladed prop. So.
Unfortunately, we have ran out of time. So this concludes our panel discussion. Thank you, leaders. I know. Thank you, leaders. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the time and our distinguished panel today. Please feel free to come forward to personally thank these wonderful leaders for their time. Thank you.